I'm going to stop my share uh, so that so that people can focus on you. Great, thank you so much. And hello everyone, and welcome to today's workshop presented by Professor Michael Ali and hosted by the University of Waterloo Electrochemical Society student chapter. Uh, before introducing our presenter, I just wanted to go over a few items. Um, first of all, uh, when, when we have the workshop and our speaker is presenting, I appreciate it if you can uh, turn off your mic so that we don't have any distraction, noise distraction. Also for graduate students who are attending from the chemical engineering department at the University of Waterloo, um, I will share a code in the chat box towards the end of the workshop, and that can be used for you to get credit for your attendance to this workshop. Um, also, as we mentioned in our ad, uh, we have raffle prizes of 10 copies of uh, the book, uh, The Craft of Scientific Presentation. It is Professor Ali's book and the winners will be announced during the break in the workshop. So now um, I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Professor Michael Ali. Professor Ali is an associate professor of engineering communication at Penn State University. He is the author of three popular textbooks, The Craft of Scientific Presentation, The Craft of Editing, and The Craft of Scientific Writing. Um, over the past decade, he has taught presentations to scientists and engineers on four continents in 16 countries and at more than 150 institutions, including Google, MIT, Harvard, and the European Space Organization. Uh, Professor Ali's websites are top Google listings for the topics of engineering presentations and scientific presentations. So please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Ali. Thank you, Kiana. That's very sweet. Thank you. So want to make sure I share my screen and everybody should be able to just in the chat. You can see the screen okay? Yes, I Okay. I can see it. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Kiana. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I got to tell you sad story. I <laughs> was doing a guest lecture and I, you know, they were so polite, but it was in that, that handoff, a uh, person introduced me, I forgot to share my screen back and I was just presenting away and talking about all kinds of things and nobody could see the screen. And that went on for 45 minutes. They were so polite. Don't be so polite. We have a chat. Uh, and so if there's something wrong, you know, let me know. Anyway, I'm real excited to be talking about this subject and particularly to graduate students. You are my favorite audience to talk about this subject of how we as scientists and engineers should present our research. And I know it's a beautiful day outside and you're probably thinking, oh man, I should go outside and just enjoy the sun. But I... I promised you I'm going to make the, these two hours, I want to make them valuable for you. And I'm not talking about just making a presentation that succeeds, but I'm really talking about how do you make a presentation that excels. All right. I said, once live caption. You got it, my man. Let's see here. All right. Live transcript is on. Thank you. Yeah, you write into the chat and and then then things, you know, I, I will try the best I can to 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 respond. So let's uh, let's let me let me just say that I know you were at different places in your research, but what we're gonna try to do today is we're gonna I'm gonna try to have you at least sketch out your next research presentation. I know for some of you, that may not be for months away. That's okay. But we're going to try to break ground on, on that. Now, a couple of things, a little bit about me. As Kiana said, I'm the author of the Craft of Scientific presentations, also the author of Craft Scientific Writing, but today we're focused on, on presentations. And this is a book that I have written 
we're in the second edition now, probably will ride a third at some at some point. But I'm real happy with with this particular edition. And, and I've learned a lot writing it, but I probably learned more from speaking to audiences such as you and learning from questions that people ask and learning from answers that people give to the questions that I ask. But you know, shown here are places in North America where I have presented. I'm excited to put uh, an, another dot here in Canada uh, for University of Waterloo after, after this, this presentation. But so I've learned quite a bit, quite a bit from, from different, different people. And these are some places internationally, I mean, outside of North America, where I have presented. Some places such as Norway, you see a cluster of points there. I go there every year and work with graduate students, kind of a national, national, national course for them. China is another place that I've been to quite a, quite a bit. But, but I've learned quite a bit about the, you know, what works and what does not work. And, and I'm going to be teaching a different approach to you. And so when someone says they're going to teach you something that's quite different from what other people do, you, sh uh, you should be skeptical. And, and, I, and I hope that you will be. So that is a little bit about me. Uh, just one more thing is that my background is actually applied science. I have an undergraduate degree in engineering science and then a master of science in electrical engineering, but it was mainly an applied science degree, that one. And I'm also, but I also have a degree in writing from the University of Alabama. And so I, in a sense, it, I didn't plan my career that way, but what has happened is, is I've just become very interested, as I mentioned, is how we as scientists and engineers, how we communicate our work. So I'd like to learn, like to learn a little bit about you. And I'm going to go to polls here and I'm going to put up the following poll. You should be able to see this poll. Can everybody see it? Can you see the poll? Okay. And now we got some people who are voting. Yep. Yep, got a number of people voting. We have 62 people in the room, 62 people in the room. Let's see if we can get everybody here to vote. When it gets to be two thirds, I'm gonna count down. So we're at half, oh, we're getting more than half. We're, we're, we're getting close, just your honest answer. By the way, this is an anonymous poll, so nobody's gonna see, see what it is that you say. Looks as if we've got two thirds, so I'm gonna start counting down. Let's see. Three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. So just you know, just interesting to look at in our in in our group right here. We've got a couple of people who are man, they are confident. They are ready to go. We've got 21 people who are have much confidence in their their you know, ability to give a talk, a research talk on their work at the end of the summer. Uh, I've got 25 people who got some confidence, and then we've got seven people, little or no confidence. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Let's 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 I tell you what, let's let, let me let me ask another question. Because there are quite a few of you, I mean all but two, who have some sense of anxiety you say is the main source of your anxiety? I mean, part of the anxiety could be in your research results, lack of confidence in the research results. Some of it could be in presentation abilities. Uh, a couple of people, I would have no anxiety bringing it on. And then some of you are in both research content and presentation ability. So, all right. Now we're over half now. Mm, coming up on two thirds. I'm going to count down three, two. Again, this one is anonymous polling. One in the polling. Okay, let's share the results to see a little bit what we've got. 
there were nine of you. Presentation wasn't the problem, but you do have that in your research. There are 25 of you. Uh, research is not so much, but you have anxiety in your presentation abilities. And then 17 of you, uh, it's both research and presentation abilities. And four of you, you are ready to go. Bring it on. So, so cool. That's that's fantastic. That's that's good for me to know. But what I see here is is that 25 plus 17 is 52, 42, I'm sorry, is that 42 of you are like, mm, you could see some improvement in your, your, your research, I mean, in your presentation abilities. And so that's where I would like to dive, just one more poll, dive a little bit deeper. If there is one thing that you could improve upon in your presentation abilities or skills, what would it be? What would it be? Structure of the presentation, words spoken during the presentation, visual aids, delivery, which is voice movements, handling equipment, and then confidence. So got quite a few, quite a few of you coming in here. Um, Again, so now we're at two thirds. I'm gonna start counting down three, two, one. All right, okay. So 20, yeah, 35% of you said words spoken during the presentation. I get that. And, and then next highest was delivery, voice, movements, handling of equipment. Nine of you said confidence is number one thing. Seven of you said structure and five of you said visual aid. So it's going to be kind of interesting because you're, 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 you're going to think this is a little odd, but I am actually going to start with visual aids and, and a reason, a reason for that is that, so you should be able to see, should be able to see the screen again. Can you share? Oh, did I not? You know, I did not share it. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, so here were the polls. Yeah, there's were the ones shared. Spoken words was the most, then delivery, then confidence, then structure. Those were very close. And then visual aid. So, so in, in through there. So good. I'm going to stop that share. And we're going to, we're going to focus. And I know it's going to sound kind of odd, but actually we're going to come back and talk about all of these. But we're, we're, we're going to, I'd, I'd like to focus a little bit on visual aids and in thinking about the answers at the beginning of the class to my question, what were the biggest problems that people see in research presentations that they attend? Most of them actually concern visual aids. Miriam's did talk about targeting of the audience but, but say mo most of the others um, concerned. So yeah, Azad says, are you talking about virtual or in person? And uh, Azada, and I'm probably not saying your name right. Mm, could be both. I would say both. I think right now we are really focused on virtual presentations. Something tells me six months from now, there's going to be a shift back to in person, but Virtual presentations are with us to stay. I mean, we have learned a lot about how to present virtually. And so when I talk about delivery, I will talk about virtual presentation. I think with slides, it's pretty close in terms of the things I would say if I was just focused on virtual presentations versus uh, in-person presentations, but I'll I'll try to I'll try to mention those. But soon, for the most part, I'm talking in person. But where I see some distinct differences, I will bring in some things about virtual. But it doesn't matter, virtual or in person. Slides have a large success on the success and more often downfall of scientific presentations than most people realize. And, and so one thing you have to know is when I started researching presentations, scientific presentations in the 1990s, 
I didn't, I didn't have this takeaway. But what happened is that I, the way that I approached scientific presentation was the same way that I approached learning about scientific writing as was what are the best people doing and how is that different from what most people do? And, and really try to get a sense of in most scientific writings and in presentations, what are the most common mistakes? And what I was finding more and more as I would ask people, what do they see that same question that I had asked you at the beginning, more and more people were talking about visual aids as a problem. And so one reason is that when you create visual aids, you make some really important decisions about what you're going to include and then what you're going to exclude. So Kiana, in her response you know, to the initial chat question, what do you see as the biggest problem in research presentations? She said that the presenter tries to present too many details. And I think all of us have been in presentations where the presenter just tries to present everything and does so very quickly and then ends up communicating very little. But the best presenters, what they do is they have a filter. And it's, and it's when you're creating slides is really when perhaps you ex exert that filter. And so, so the best presenters have a filter for what they're gonna include and what they're gonna exclude. And then I'd even say on what you're gonna include, there's a second filter on what you're going to emphasize and then what you're going to subordinate. And, and again, with slides, you can make that distinction because you decide you'll put something on a slide, then that you're going to emphasize. Something you're just going to fold into your speech, you're not going to put into a slide. And so, so slides make a big difference there. So a lot of you talked about delivery, slides make a really big difference on delivery. I mean, how many of us have been in a presentation where the speaker puts up a new slide, turns to the screen, or if it's virtual, just focuses on the screen, and then starts reading or paraphrasing bullets from the slide. And then, boy, there is this rhythm that arises. And a lot of people call it uh, this death by PowerPoint rhythm. And, and, and I, you know, the big thing is, is I would say we can do better. We can do better than that. Okay, we can do better than that. And then a third, third thing, and it's probably the, the most important, but here at Penn State where I where I teach is that We've done some experiments. I've worked with cognitive psychologists, and we have designed some experiments to find out how much of a difference slides make. And so essentially, we've given the same scientific presentation to two large audiences or to sets of large audiences, and then found out how much that each audience understood. And in each presentation, the audience heard the exact same words. What was different is the only difference was the slides that were shown. Now we took the speaker out of these, of these tests, but what we found is, is that if you design slides well, and you think about cognitive psychology principles about how people learn when you design slides, you can have a statistically significant gain in how much people understand and remember. And what I'm gonna say is most people don't do that, okay? Most people don't do that. Most people follow PowerPoint's defaults and, they, and their slides kind of all look alike. And so I'm gonna challenge you to, you know, I'm gonna challenge the status quo here. Cool, so that's a little bit about why we're gonna talk about slides first. Main assumption is that when you are given a research presentation, the number one goals that you have are that the audience understand your content, 
remember your content and believe your content. And remembering your content, I think is more important than people realize. You go to a conference, you go to several sessions of that conference. Each session has five different speakers. Let's say you go to five different sessions during the conference. That's 25 speakers you have listened to. You come back to your home institution. People say, what was that conference like? What, what, what were the best talks? And how many do you remember? Two, three, four, maybe five. You want your talk to be in the five most remembered of the people going back. Because that's a lot of ways that, that our work gets spread. I mean, certainly we have publications and, and, and we do guest lectures and things like that. But another important way is how much people just remember. And then they, in a sense, tell your story. And it's certainly to be believed. That's a, that's a, it, you may give a great talk, people understand it, people remember it, but if they don't believe it, mm, <laughs> you didn't accomplish much. And then I'd say all of us have kind of as a personal goal is we want to be more confident. And there are a couple of different kinds of confidence. And the confidence we think about first is the confidence inside. It's that feeling we have just moments before, or maybe even can be days before we're going to give a presentation. You know, Marie Curie, well, <laughs> her, her daughters wrote that they knew whenever she was going to have to teach because of the way she acted in the morning. I mean, unbelievable. The only person who has two technical Nobel Prizes, and yet she, she had a, a fear of giving presentations, even presenting to her graduate students who, who stood at attention whenever she came into the room. But, but there's that kind of confidence. And then there's a the second kind of confidence that actually I would argue is more important. It's the confidence that you project to the audience. And so that's, a, that's kind of a personal goal that we have. All right then, so I'm going to teach you this, this different approach. It's assertion evidence approach. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, essentially thinking about what is it your, what your claim is or what, what is it you're trying to assert and then coming up with visual evidence to support it. We, You know, at this point, I don't expect you to believe it, but I would say there is a resource, this assertionevidence.com, and as Kiana said, you can find that resource by, by just typing in engineering presentation. Scientific presentations, I'm not quite as high yet, but if you type in engineering presentations into Google, it's usually one of the first few sites that comes up. So, but biggest thing is, is it leads to more comprehension and you project more confidence to the audience. And so a number of laboratories around the world have adopted it. At Penn State, the laboratory that brings in the most research funding every year, and you're seeing this, this particular lab, this particular lab uh, uses, uses this approach. Just as an anecdote, there's one conference, it's a heat transfer conference they go to um, every, they go up like every three years. And so they've sent seven graduate students to this conference. This conference happens to have best presentation by a graduate student. And this laboratory is seven for seven. Now they have great content, got to have great content, but they also really communicate their content, understanding, remembering, and then believing. And then our largest courses, uh, in our, our in the College of Engineering, uh, this is this is this course happens to be our largest course. Teachers use it, students use it. It's the most efficient way to communicate. It's a design course, and it's a course where all team teams of students of four or five students, some well, more three or four students, they come up with the design and teachers they prefer them to use this approach because it's just it's just more efficient. So backing up just a little bit to have a successful presentation, you first have to have content. Now, in the old days, I used to ask this question, what, you know, what, what, what made for a successful presentation? 
And I've asked, you know, probably now hundreds, hundreds of scientists and engineers around the world. So content is one. Does anybody have an idea what the two and three uh, ingredients for a, let's don't say successful, let's say excellent, an excellent presentation would be in the chat. Any guesses on what you think also, besides just that strong content, what else would be important? These are, this, and these are bigger picture, big picture things. Uh, so presentation, the whole thing's a presentation. What about it? Mm. Connection with the audience, connecting with the audience, Abdullah and David Puth, that's one of the three big ones. That's one of the three big ones. You don't have Hans Rosling, he's gonna represent the second. Engaging the audience, Stephen says. Yeah, engaging, engaging the audience. So, so uh, Naraju, I'm gonna say this idea of content is it. And, 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 and so that's the one. Stephen Hawking is kind of my hero here because he can't do a lot of the, the things, let's say on delivery that you typically think about as great delivery, but he still packed rooms whenever he spoke. And the reason was he had, he had content, content that was valuable. You know, the second most common thing that scientists and engineers tell me is passion. Passion for the subject, which then is a way that you engage the audience. And Hans Rosling is my hero is my hero here and or he was my hero he just passed away uh, last year but if it, you've seen anybody seen ted talk any of the ted talks by hans rosling I, I love his first ted talk i think that's my my favorite anybody anybody see these he does world health statistics so he's presenting some world health statistics nobody is you know there's uh let's see do kind of a participant list. You can do a yes, no on your participant list. Haven't seen Rosling. I'm not getting any. Some people have. Sid Hearth. Uh, Sid Hearth has. Yeah, yeah. Great presenter. Encourage you to watch that one. Yeah, Abdullah, not yet. Watch his first one, 2006. Man's amazing, but passion. And then the third one, and a number of you had mentioned that one, Abdullah and David, connecting with the audience. I mean, having a keen sense of your audience. And so Jane Goodall, she's my, she's my hero here. So let's, let, let's focus a little bit on audience. What would you say are the most important and most important questions to ask about audience? most important questions to ask about audience as a scientist presenting her or his research in the chat what would you say is the most important questions to ask about audience what background off does the audience have very good gillian level of expertise alex it's really good familiarity with the material that's very good david yeah the background that's certainly one of them i'm going to give you i'm, I'm going to give you one because a lot of times we overlook it but just who are they a, a challenge for us and this was this goes back to something that miriam had talked about is that a lot of times we have people with different levels of understanding, but it's important to realize who is in the room, okay? Because and if, one thing that makes our presentations tough is sometimes we have experts in the room, sometimes we have people who are outside our expertise, and we'd like to reach both of them. And then what you said, what did they know about, what did they know about our work? And then Aaron here asked a really good question and, and it's actually a question that, that kind of goes back to what he had talked about earlier in the chat. And it is, what do they want to get out of your presentation? Or what is it about your work that will interest them? Or why are they attending your presentation? And that one is really important because that one is going to help you decide on what to include and again equally important what to exclude you can't present everything that you've done 
that's not that's not uh, going to not not going to help the you know that that's, that's going to overwhelm the audience. So so there's kind of a good place here for us to start. I would say another thing is is knowing that audience. I think a really important thing is knowing what your main message is. In other words, if if the audience could remember just one sentence about your presentation, what would that sentence be? And so I'm going to show you one from a research talk. This is by a chemist, chem, chemistry uh, student at the University of Oslo. And, and her her big takeaway, and you may not necessarily understand it right now, and that's okay, but understand that, that she, she wanted that audience at the end of her presentation to leave the room with that statement. Our work shows that atmospheric mercury depletion events lead to increased mercury and in surface snow. And that was, for her, the main takeaway. Now, that maybe the words don't mean so much to you at this point, but she's going to make sure her presentation gives that statement meaning. But this is a question that I have for you. And you know, some of you may not necessarily know what, what you're going to, you know, what, what, what exactly what your main takeaway is of your talk. But I think almost all of you probably have a research hypothesis at this point. So assume you do your experiments and that you just assume you validate your research hypothesis. That could be your main message. So it's, you can think about it as your most important takeaway. I, I want you to write it as a complete sentence. She didn't just write, she didn't just write atmospheric mercury depletion events. That's not, that's not the takeaway. What do they want to get out of your, what, what is your main message of your next presentation? And I, into the chat, I'd like you to think for just a minute and to write that, write that statement, okay? Try to drop that in the chat because that's going to give you some focus. Okay, Abdullah has one. And probably what you'll say, Abdullah, is, is some technique that you have developed allows for the increase in contrast. So yeah, look at what Aaron's written. Yeah, computational modeling of bacterial communities allows for rational engineering of microbiomes. Yeah, very good. Yep, the use, very good, Kiana. The use of mixed MSA chloride solution increases the exchange current density of zinc redox reaction. Very good. Gillian, different carbon materials exhibit different lithium metal plating behavior depending on their chemical structure. These are all excellent. Okay, I mean, you have, in a sense, a goal. And so you think about it, your research talk has got to lead that audience such that they understand that statement, they remember that statement, and they believe that statement. Okay, and so, I mean, there's still a challenge on all of them, but you know where it is that you are headed. So Mohan, you don't quite have it yet. It's not a sentence, um, but but you but you're yeah. 
I don't, it's, it's not something I could argue with. See, I could argue with all these others. I could challenge them. I mean, it is a, it is a step up the mountain. Vehicle structures with superior crash worthy can be efficiently designed with advanced response surface methods. Very good, David. Very good, Bruna. Yeah. Okay. It is a, it is a statement was improved by 40%. Ah, Okasha, you're not there yet. You got a title, you know, but you, I want you to write it as a sentence, write it as something that then in a sense, somebody could challenge. I think there's a sentence that's in there. I think there's a sentence in there for you, both you and 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 for uh, Mo Han, okay, but write it as a sentence. Okay, cool. So we are going to so move on. And essentially, I want each of you kind of to have that statement. And that is going to be your goal, this little star here. And you are going to be, in a sense, you can think of yourself as a, as a mountain guide. And you are leading your audience up the mountain of your research to give them this vista that you, you have. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Arash has one. Okay, so, so, so very good, very good. And, and we're gonna think about this journey. We're gonna think about it in three parts. We're gonna think about the beginning. And by the way, this analogy actually is kind of based on something Einstein said, but we're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna think about this beginning and then we're going to think about the middle and, and then we'll think about the ending, okay? And so we're gonna start with the beginning and the beginning is so important in a research, in a research talk and, and, and probably a, a, something I want you to think about in crafting your beginning is something that people said about Einstein. So Einstein's kind of a funny guy he was something of a recluse, didn't have a lot of close friends, but he was an incredible presenter. And, and one thing that people noticed about him at conferences is that he was just much more patient than other scientists in the beginning of his talk. And people ask him, how come, you know, you're so patient at the beginning? And he said, it's very important to him that everyone in the room at least know what he's doing and why he's doing it, okay? And, and that they understand that. And so that I would say is a really important takeaway for us because I see this a lot. I see a lot of people that are rushing to get through the beginning and, and they just want to get to the middle, uh, but but you wanna, you wanna be patient here. And so let's say we've got our takeaway. We're, be, we're crafting that beginning. And, and I wanna just think about the first scene because the first scene is important. And so, <clears throat> you know, you're coming up before the audience and the audience is there, they're waiting, we've been introduced. And, you know, there's kind of this wonderful pause before you begin speaking. And what are the first things that you say? What is it that you show? And what I see is a lot of people, this is the way they begin. My name is Stuart Apple and I'm working with Carrie Cho and Dale Gray and we're from the environmental engineering department at such and such a university. And what we're working on today is atmospheric mercury depletion events, AMDEs in polar regions during Arctic spring. And then that scene is gone. And you know, people think real quickly. So my question to you is, what do you think about this talk? What do you think about this talk? Because I mean, you see this talk all the time. I mean, it's not this particular talk, but you kind of see this, this certainly see this kind of opening. What do you think? What do you think about this talk? Boring one, Abdullah says. Let me ask you this, you ready to go? You ready to start the journey? I mean, because it kind of already started. They're gonna read more off their slides, Aaron says. I, I love David, yeah, I have no idea what the title means. Does it grab my attention, Abdullah says. 
these these are all good. These are all good. And 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 what I would suggest to you is, particularly since you're younger, you don't yet have a a reputation, is I would not leave that first scene until the audience feels comfortable with the title. And another thing you should think about is people at conferences, they make decisions. Do I go to this room? Do I go to that room? And maybe they didn't go to your room because of you. Maybe there was somebody else they went to. And, and so, but they're thinking, I don't know who this graduate student is. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I should go down the hall. In the beginning of your talk, give them a reason to stay. And I think I, I, I would just say that that to me is a is is, is a real valuable, real, real valuable um, piece of advice. So what want to explore why? Why do so many people have this kind of first scene? So you've got a title, then they've got their name and there's affiliation. Maybe there's just some, you know, some PowerPoint artwork or something. Why? Why do so many people start this way? Because I've, I've kind of looked at it. More than 50%, actually a lot of times more than two-thirds of the people, that's essentially what their first slide looks like. Why do they begin that way? You know. You know the answer. Why do they begin that way? But why? Yeah, so Stephen, I'm asking, why did they begin that way? Templates. Yeah, David said, that's one reason, yeah, yeah. They, they're following the template and the template has that. And in particular, there's one template that, that has that. Whose template am I talking about? There's one template that has that. Yeah, PowerPoints. Yeah, if you look at PowerPoints default, it looks something like this for their title slide. And so a lot of people, like I even see conferences now, they'll, they'll give presenters a template. Don't use their template, by the way. They'll give their <laughs> presenters a template and they're just following PowerPoints defaults. The important thing to realize is, you know what year, you know what year PowerPoint came out? I mean, it was before you were born. But any idea what you know what what the what when it was, what years, kind of what decade? 80s. Yeah, it came out in the middle of the 80s, 1987, actually. But but <clears throat> you have to understand you weren't around, but the computer architecture of the day was such it was really hard to put images into programs. And so the initial defaults don't have any images. So, but they had to put things someplace because they want to put it up at the top because you have all this white space. They kind of put it, kind of put it here. And there is no research behind this default, none. And the big thing is we can do better. We can do better. So I'd like to talk about what Katrina Aspmo, okay, who actually she was, as I said, she was doing, working on her master's in 2004 when she took my workshop. And she, she, she kind of took one of those templates that I had and she ran with it. And, and so I'm going to show her first scene in just a second, just a little bit about her that was really important. She went to go see her advisor in chemistry and she asked, so I'm gonna be giving this conference in Portland, Oregon here this summer. Mm, first question, how many people are gonna be in the room? And her advisor said, mm, about 75. So she said, ooh, cause she'd never spoken to that many people before. And she said, how many, how many of them know what an atmospheric mercury depletion event is. And her advisor said, mm, let's say five. You're one, I'm another. Our colleague Tarun Berg is a third. And I think there are two Swedes who know what it is. And so that gave, that really kind of set things up for Katrina. And here is the opening scene that she gave. Hello, my name is Katrina Aspo, and I'm working with Tarun Baird from the Norwegian Institute of Air Research. But I'm also working with Professor Greta Wibito from the University of Oslo. 
And what we're trying to understand is what happens to atmospheric mercury when it depletes or falls out of the atmosphere. Now, many of you may not realize, but in the room right here, there's in the atmosphere, there's a certain amount of mercury. It's not much. It's about one and a half nanograms per liter. And in this room, it stays there. But for some reason, and scientists aren't sure why, in the polar regions of the world, such as this beautiful Nulalasund region here of Norway, you have these events. They have kind of fancy name atmospheric mercury depletion events, but there are these events where that level of mercury drops to zero. And so the question comes, where does the mercury go? I mean, a lot of people hypothesize that it goes into the surface snow, but no one has verified that. And so that is my research question to determine whether where that atmospheric mercury goes. So you may not be able to see it, but in this beautiful picture here, in the lower right, there's a cabin. And I stayed in this cabin for about a month and a half. And during that month and a half, I made simultaneous measurements of the amount of mercury that's in the atmosphere with the amount of mercury that's in the surface snow to test the hypothesis that that is in fact where that atmospheric mercury goes. And you might be asking why? What's, what's the reason? And I would say, you know, for the polar bears and for the Arctic foxes and for those stray Norwegians who come up to this area of the world, it is important to know because I think everyone in the room knows that mercury is dangerous for mammals. At high levels, it can cause paralysis and even higher levels, it can cause death. And so our research is to determine, in fact, where that atmospheric mercury, where it goes. So, so you've heard this beginning. How many people are ready to go on this, this journey? How many people are ready to go on this journey? Abdullah says he's up. Yep, yep. Aaron, Mohan, Cole, yeah, yeah. I, and you know, I remember I was in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Oslo. Uh, it was May 2004, and I heard her give that first scene, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm a lucky person. I am in this room. I'm listening to this talk, and I'm going to learn something. In fact, I've already learned something, and that's what I would suggest to you is that first scene, give the audience something, and so I, I'd like for you in a sense, I'm gonna create a breakout so you can kind of share things. Some of you may have created a, a, a title slide and so you can show it. Others of you maybe have not, but I, what I want you to think about is, I want you to think about what kind of title slide you would create. And in particular, uh, you know, if you, have a, if you have a title, you can write that title and, that, and that's valuable. But what would be an image or series of images that you could show that would help orient the audience? Okay, so I'm going to put you in a breakout room. You'll be in a breakout room of two or three people being here for a few minutes. But I'd like for everybody to speak. Uh, do a, you need to do a little bit of thinking for just a, a minute, a minute and a half or so. But then I'd like for everybody to speak about what kind of entry point, and particularly what kind of image or series of images you would show to orient the audience to your title. Okay? Does everybody have an idea of what it is that they're doing? 
So, okay, getting it down here. Yeah. So, we're going to have 23 rooms and going to put you into those. And even if you don't have a great idea on yours, you can be a good listener for someone else. Think about your title scene. What images would you have there? What those images would be to orient your audience? Go. Okay, we got a lot of people joining. Okay, just got a couple of you haven't joined yet. Alreza, you haven't joined yet. Sarah, you have not joined yet. Um, let's see here. Yuqing, Yuqing, you have not joined yet. Your, there you go. Very, very good. You, Jing, you, you have not joined yet. Oh, poor you. Can how come you are not joining? Why are you not joining? Why are you not joining? Hmm. We've got. Oh boy, this poor person. You, you, you have not joined, and and you're not you're not helping. Uh, the some people are are by themselves. This poor person in eighteen is by himself. Oh, hello. Hey, Aaron. Oh, hi, Michael. Um, sorry for just jumping here. I think my partner is uh, absent, so he, they weren't responding. Can I give you another room? Can I put you in another room? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I had some of these people that, yeah.
Guys, no one was in my room. If you're still around and you're looking for someone to talk about that, maybe we can talk about that here. Yeah, sure. So what would you put in your presentation? Well, um, as, a, as a picture, I would, um, I would put this slide of uh, me working with the robot we're having. So, and as a slide, I want to see, I want to say that um, can reinforcement learning be used to adaptively assist patients during rehabilitation? Interesting. Yeah, me for myself, I guess, uh, working on X-ray imaging. So probably I'm going to put like two different uh, images um, of the same object at two different scenarios or two different conditions and show that how uh, using the new technique and like the new approach, I can improve the, um, the contrast and resolution of my imaging and what would be application. Probably I'm just going to talk about the mammography as an application and uh, raise the question why I need high resolution imaging for mammography. What are the uh, challenges or um, what would be the consequence or what would be the result of that if I have a high resolution um, mammography imaging by showing a couple of images? That's cool. Humors, if you are also around, you may want to talk about yours. Michael, no one was in our room, so no one showed up. No one spoke. <laughs> that, that's why we left the room and came here. That's absolutely fine, Abdullah. Yeah, we had some people who had a tough time joining. Yeah, and I'm not. They may be there. Sometimes connection goes out, and then they then they lose the room. So some That's people right. don't have great connection. Okay. okay, everybody's coming back. Fantastic. This is really good. Yeah. So yeah, some people said their internet's not good, and so that that's that's a problem with break, breakout rooms, is that they they. They go in and then they get kicked out. So, and then they can't get back in. So, but, and I know that not every group was able to go around probably everybody and everybody talk about what it is that they're going to, going to be doing. But I hope that everybody kind of has a sense, you know, at least some confidence in what it is you're trying to do at that beginning. It may, you may not necessarily have to do as much as Katrina did. I mean, Katrina did her whole introduction on that title slide, but I would do something. I would not leave that scene until the audience and the whole audience feels comfortable with your title. That's my, that's, that's probably my big takeaway. Now <clears throat> we're going to move into middles now, but we are close to the midpoint. And so this is probably a really good time to take a break. All right, 207, let's get going. So those of you who watched the preparation film, you're going to have an idea about what this, this, this next question is. But I've done surveys of scientists and engineers around the world and asked them, what do they see as the biggest three problems with slides? And so I'm, I'm going to... What I'm, what I'm going to do is, is I, I'm, I'm going to do a poll here and see what it is that you think about those. So, it, so you, can, you can answer for yourself what you see as the biggest problems with slides. I give you, I, I give you about eight, eight choices here. 
So what do you see? So this is, we're going to go with just one problem. What do you see is the biggest problem with slides? Well, we got 13 people, 14 people have answered, 18, 20, almost, at, well, we're halfway there. Two thirds have answered. Yeah, there are no wrong answers on this one. So I'm going to start counting down three, two, one in polling and share the results. And the big winner, okay, 32, 82% of you said too much text. And wow, let's see what I get. Oh, I'm looking here. Oh, <laughs> that had to be my next slide. Too much text. I knew that was going to, I knew that was going to be the answer. But, and I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about, about the why on that. And, and I'll say something about some of the others some of the others as, as well, but too much text. And we've seen lots of examples of that. I'll just flip through just a couple that I have uncovered, you know, over the years. Yeah, just a lot of text, a lot of text there, you know, to, to read. Then I'm sorry, I think for a minute. Doing? Can you still see the screen? Yes, but Can for a minute. Can you still see the like... screen? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, I'm going to close. Uh, let me go back. Yeah. So <clears throat> we've had a little, little power disruption here now. Yeah. Mm. You could still see the slides, is that right? Yes. Okay, so there are a couple of others that that we that we have. Um, but too many words is the number one thing, and I'll talk a little bit about the why on that in just a second. Another one is clutter. And I can't remember if it was Gillian or no, it was Miriam. She had identified that as a problem that people try to put too many images on a slide and and and, and actually a, a number of people probably say that's the second biggest problem it's not necessarily just text but your eye as an audience member does not know where to go okay so that i would say is another one something a lot of times it's it's associated with too much text and then the third one is the text is too small to read, okay? So those are the big three. I mean, there are others, there are no wrong answers here, but what I would suggest to you is, is when you are designing visual aids, make sure you address those three, okay? Make sure you address those three. But I wanna talk about the why on too many words. And before I do that, Mm, those of you who watched the film, do you remember why it's too many words? Why, why is that one such a problem for us? Does anybody remember those of you who watched the film or maybe some of you have done your own reading? Okay, Gillian here is, has, <clears throat> the the answer that's that's more rooted in psychology research is that you cannot process what the speaker is saying when you ha when when there's too much text on the screen all right and so let's look a little bit at the reason for that so let's say you've got a speaker and you've got an audience that speaker is going to have spoken words and going to have written words that are going to be shown and if the number of written words is not too many, as it, and, and if those words actually complement what the speaker is saying, that if you had three rooms, one room where they're projecting these words, another room where the audience is just listening, not seeing anything, 
and another room where the audience is just seeing the screen, the room with both the written words and the spoken words would have the highest comprehension. However, uh, as this Pybio pointed out, our brains, this is, and this is kind of later 1980s, our brains process both written words and spoken words in the same part. So the same part of the brain processes both written words and spoken words. And so a psychology researcher by the name of John Sweller then asked the research question, well, if your brain is processing both written words in the second and, and spoken words in the same place, could that part of the brain become overloaded, much as a central processing unit can become overloaded when it tries to do too many tasks? And so he did experiments. And what he found is that when you show too much text, this condition, and he calls it an overload condition, occurs. And then the comprehension in that room where there's too much text projected plummets. And in fact, it's lower comprehension than in a room where an audience is just listening, doesn't have anything to read, or is just reading, doesn't have anyone talking. And to me, that is an incredibly important takeaway in the design of slides, because what it says is that, and a colleague of mine by the name of Jean-Luc Dumont uh, makes this point, that bad slides are worse than no slides. That if you had no slides, it would be better than if you had slides that have too much text. And that is, that is something actually a lot of people do not realize. And so, so there's another thing, another psychology principle that's important for you to realize, and it has to do with images. Does anybody remember where images are processed or in relation to where text is processed? Does anybody remember that? I don't know. Maybe I didn't put that in there. Uh, maybe you didn't watch that particular film. But images are processed in a different part of the brain. And, and so another researcher by the name of Richard Mayer says, well, you've got images processed in another part of the brain. Then would it not be advantageous to have an image on every scene because the audience in a sense could take that in. It's like a different path or road, traffic road you can think about to the reader. And so Pybio found the process in different parts of the brain. And then this Meyer found that people learn more deeply from words and relevant images than words alone. And so those are the two principles on which the assertion evidence approach is based. And so the assertion evidence approach has three principles. I'm going to give you two right here. Principle number one, build your talk on messages, not on topics. Most people build their talks on topics, introduction, methods, results, discussion. And what we're saying is build your talk on messages. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, is that a message is a much better filter than a topic at reducing words. So even though you're spending more words in your headline, you end up spending far fewer words in the body of the text. And so this example that you see right here is a really good example. So sure, she's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. She's got 12 words up there. But then when you look down in the body, she's only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So she's got like 21 words on this slide. But and and compare that with what most scientists and engineers have. Most scientists and engineers in our studies have about 35 to 40. So my slides aren't synced. I think we're on a previous slide. So you should be seeing build your talk on messages, not on topics. 
I see a high driving slide. Hmm. Tell you what I'm going to do. Let me let, 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 let me let me just kind of get out of this one. And then it's good. Thank you for letting me know that. Now I'm going to uh, let's go back. So how about this? Do you see her now? Oh, okay. Not yet. Yeah, that's right, because we lost the share screen. Cool. Mm, how about now? Do you see a woman who's presenting a bar graph? Yes. Awesome. That's exactly what you should be seeing. So, so that's one big reason. I'd say another thing is, is, and some people say, well, this is unusual. Actually, it's not that unusual to have headings that are sentences. I mean, look at our newspapers. So one of my favorite newspapers in 2020 was, or well, not favorite newspapers, but newspaper articles was the one that I have highlighted here. And if you look at the heading, it's a sentence. Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine is 90% effective. Boom, that's a fantastic headline. That's a, it was a great headline for 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 the world there and so people are accustomed to seeing that I'd say another thing is is that think about yourself when you're at a conference I mean how many times do we get lost in a scene and then we start looking at the slide desperately to try to figure out what is the main takeaway putting that main takeaway at the top is to me like a safety rope for the audience. They can just, they, they can grab onto that rope and, and stay in the game. Yeah, they might have missed by reading it. They might have missed uh, some of the things, secondary details that were spoken, but they got the primary detail of that scene and they can stay in the presentation. Build your talk on messages, not on topics. Just a little bit of things in terms of recommendations. Keep that headline to one or two lines. If it's, if it's more than two lines, we have found, our focus groups have found, people won't read it. Second, let justify the headline. Don't center it. PowerPoint will try to center it. Don't pay attention to them. It's very much, it's a North American thing that we left justify our, our headlines. That's the way that we, we read, okay? So that's, that, that I would say is, is important. And then when you think about your talk, we had talked about having that main message. In a sense, think about each scene as having a supporting message that's going to lead that audience to the main message. And so I'll, I'll, I'll spend some more time talking about that, but that is in a sense the idea that if you just looked at the headlines, they would be almost an abstract in the, in the sense that they would be a series of sentences that is fashioning your argument and leading the audience to this main takeaway. Okay, so that was principle number one. Principle number two is support your messages with visual data, <laughs> not bullet lists. I know a lot of people like to put bullet lists. Bullet lists are the things that they're going to say, but this is your research. Build the bodies on visual evidence, which the audience can process. And so that visual evidence, sometimes it can be photographs. More often, it'll be drawings or diagrams, or it'll be graphs. Could be a table, though you need to be careful that you don't overwhelm the audience with a table. And I could, I could talk about that maybe in the question period. So... Those are the two principles. Build your talk on messages, not topics. Support those messages with visual evidence, not bullet lists. 
And so I'd like to apply those principles to creating some scenes. And, and, and in doing that, in doing these scenes, I'm gonna follow Einstein's advice for scientific writing. In scientific writing, he said, keep things as simple as possible, yet no simpler. So what does he mean by the yet no simpler? What does he mean by the yet no simpler? What do you think he means by yet no simpler? Yeah, that's right. You don't want to oversimplify the content. You don't want to lose the content. And so that to me is really what makes uh, scientific presentations, I mean, is really the big challenge. And Einstein, I think, I think nails it. But let's, let, let's, let's kind of dive in. So I'm going to show you a, show you a kind of a challenging scene. And it's from a scene that's given here uh, by this particular graduate student, Michelle Case. And so Michelle Case is really kind of a math, she's a mathematician, but she is applying her math to, and so math, you go, oh man, it's going to be tough. And she's applying her math to a practical application, which is mm, kind of, it's, it's a wind turbine. And it, you're trying to produce power, electrical power from the wind. And so we usually think about these wind turbines on these tall poles, but these wind turbines, they're buoyant. And so they are actually on cables and the advantage is they can go much higher than poles. Poles can go like two to 300 meters. Those are like a lot of the really big ones, but these can go like a thousand meters high or 2000 meters high. And up at that altitude, winds are faster, winds are more consistent. But something happens here is that the, because, because, just, just because you, I mean, even though you're, you're, you're trying to control it here from the ground because it's tethered, it ends up going in a figure eight fashion. And all you can control is just how, how big that eight is, you know, the shape of that eight. And, and what people have found very quickly when they started doing that, th this particular work, is that that arc, the shape of the eight, actually affects how much power is produced. And it's rather complicated because faster winds would have a different shape than slower winds. So, so, it's, so it's kind of a complicated problem. And what she's trying to, what Michelle's trying to understand and what she talks about on this slide is her research question is to determine how, no matter what the wind speed is, how to decide what the best shape will be so that you produce optimal power, okay? So pretty cool title slide she's got. So we're gonna dive into the procedure section. And so a lot of people, what they'll do in the method section, they'll just have methods in like 44 point type, and then they'll have a bullet list, and then they have some real tiny, photographs or, or drawings that are on the side. Michelle didn't do it that way. The way she figured it is, is look, she, she just in her voice said, hey, you know, let, let's, let's look at our method. She made the transition to methods. And then she tried to think what's an important takeaway the audience needs to know in her methods. And for her, an important takeaway was how this her her big technique was using something called extremum seeking and she knew a lot of people in her audience didn't know what that meant but so she essentially wanted to define extremum seeking so we're going to go to that scene so it sounds like it's going to be a really tough scene but watch how she does it so extremum seeking uses kind of a small perturbation it's called a 
dither to slowly test which direction improves performance. So the situation is you've got this thing way up there, a thousand meters up in the up in the up in the sky, and you're trying, you're you're, you're trying to know should I should I make it bigger or should I make it smaller? The the circles in the in the figure eight. And you're not exactly sure what the wind speed is. So that really makes it tough. So what you do is, and so she does this computationally, so that she could do it very quickly, is she does what's called this dither. And in this dither, she had kind of guessed what the wind speed is, but she's not exactly sure. If she knew exactly what the wind speed is, then she could come up with the 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 weight, you know, the shape of that figure eight, but she's got to figure out what that wind speed is. So she does that little dither. And the question comes when she goes this way, or does it, does the performance go down or does it go up? And, and so part of her, her, her mathematics is to use this thing called an estimate gradient. Okay. And it looks like there's some Laplace transforms in there, and she would be able to explain that. But, but in a sense, what I'm doing is kind of walking you through her scene, okay? And then she kind of puts that in there, and what she finds out is that she needs to move, the slope needs to move in this direction. And then how far does she need to go? That's another part of the mathematics, this gradient ascent, okay? So, so here's a question I have for you. So she's kind of explained her technique of extreme of seeking. And uh, I mean, I wasn't here to do it. You can go to assertionevidence.com and you can see her film and you can see her explain it. But in general, what do you like about the scene? What do you like about what she did to try to explain this mathematical concept. What do you like? What do you think is a best practice? Excellent, Keith. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant on her part. You know, graying out those boxes What's nice is, is that your eye goes to that graph. Then she explains the graph. Then she then reveals one of the boxes and then your eye goes to that. Each step is visually demonstrated. Very nice, Aaron. Yeah, exactly. It just didn't leave us with just a bullet or something like that. I mean, she's got either the, the mathematics there, she's got some kind of curve, yeah, that's there. I'd say those two, those two are really, really nice. And in a sense, she, she moves from one to the other, okay? And, and things changed as you see on the, on the graph, which is, which is actually pretty cool. Okay, so that I would say is a good thing. Plus, then you've got your safety rope up at the top for that audience that zones out, gets a text they have to look at, and then comes back in. So that I would say is, is really valuable. Say so a second thing is try to present each scene as a story. You know, I've always heard people say, yeah, you should tell stories. You need to be a storyteller. And, and I've always felt uncomfortable with that because, I, I mean, the big story that we tell, it's kind of hard. But I can see thinking about each scene as a vignette, okay? Just a, just a, a real short story that you're going to tell. So I'm going to do another one. This one's from a forestry student who was looking at the effects of people, visitors to state parks on the quality of the water in streams. So he was looking at something like 63 streams 
in three different state parks in the northeastern United States. And so, again, he was in the procedures section. And again, he didn't just have procedures and a bullet list. He tried to think of what are the main takeaways in the procedure section and then have a scene for each of those. And one takeaway was how is he defining pollution, okay? And so for the 53 streams, his name's Jimmy Weber. So he talks about it as a team. We assess the conditions using a set of six criteria, how acidic the water is, how much chlorides in the water, how much sulfates in the water, total amount of phosphorus, total amount of nitrogen, and then this thing called average habitat score. And so he had the 53 streams that he was examining. He also had 12 reference streams, okay? So 12 reference streams. And it, for him, they were streams in the Northeast, but they were isolated from man. So you figure that they are about as clean, at least from man, as they can get. And so ideally, you would have had the levels of acidity, chloride, and all these fall into the same band as the levels for the reference stream, okay? But, and it was really interesting, at this point in the presentation, he kind of broke from what's tradition, and he went ahead and gave two of his most important results. And the reason was, he was set up to do so, and he wanted to emphasize those. So an important result that he had was that the sulfate levels for the 53 streams were distinctly outside the reference band, okay? They weren't to a place where fish and plants were negatively affected, but they were distinctly beyond the reference band, okay? And another result was that the chloride levels were not only outside the reference band, but they were down to a level where fish uh, and other wildlife were impaired. I love this scene. I saw him give this scene once and I can give, the, I can tell people this scene. It's, it's incredibly memorable. But what I really like is how he tells the scene as a story. How are we doing? I've shown you a couple of examples. Any questions? Any questions so far? There was one person who had a question earlier. How to tell if my introduction is too long or not. So, you know, the thing I would say is, boy, you, ah, you don't want to go more than, hmm, Probably, you'd probably like, you think about how much time that you have, probably 25% of your total time, that would be the maximum time you'd give to your introduction. If it's more than that, the audience might start to get uncomfortable. That's what I would say there. Though sometimes I have, in a sense, given a proposal presentation that's essentially two scenes. First scene, what is the problem? Second scene, what's the proposed solution? And so in that case, that's a little different from a research talk. Now, any other questions that we have? So cool. So I wanna do a before and after. And this one is one I just got in the, in the last year. And so I'm not gonna say, with whom I was working, but you'll, you'll see some references, but it was, it was at a, it was at a company that hires quite a few chemists and they do a lot of biochemistry, but <clears throat> what they were working on is <clears throat> they were working, I think somebody here was doing on microbiome diversity. And so they were in kind of a literature review portion. And so I'm gonna show you a before. 
So, so here was the original scene that they had. And they, they have, a, have a phrase title. So it's effective root of antibiotic administration on fecal microbiome diversity. They have a graph from this article. They have actually kind of the summary there and they've got a couple of bullet points, okay? So <laughs> it's kind of intimidating, huh? If you're in the audience. So here was the revision that I did on this one such that it became an assertion evidence. So I had to think quite a bit, what is the main takeaway? And the main takeaway here was that oral administration of an antibiotic can have a statistically a significant effect on fecal microbiome diversity, okay? So that is the takeaway. And I essentially took out all the body text except for the graph. So I wanted to explain to the audience the, the graph. And so what you have here is you, you have this results of an experiment that use these rhesus monkeys. And these rhesus, rhesus monkeys received an antibiotic one of two ways. One was an oral administration, okay? And the other one was an injection. And in the graph, the red represents the injection and the black here represents the oral uh, administration. And, and we have this term, I know, I think Aaron here knows what this is. He could probably explain it much better than I, but we have this term called Shannon index. And that is, that's a way to characterize this fecal microbiome diversity. And ideally you would like to have a lower Shannon index, okay? You would like to reduce that Shannon index. So as I said, you've got, you've got these rhesus monkeys uh, six of them received intravenous and 15 of them received the oral. And they received it for a two week period, okay? In a consistent, consistent fashion. And what you see, I mean, it starts day one for the rhesus monkeys that received the oral. There's a statistically significant uh, improvement in the Shannon index, okay? And you see that it continues for day four, day seven, day 14. And then day 14, they stop the antibiotic and you see that then the Shannon index kind of goes back to where, where it was. So the, so the Shannon index improved with this, uh, with, with, with this oral administration. And the difference was statistically significant. So that's the way here that, that I suggested presenting it. Now, one thing that I would say is some people would say, well, the other, other slide works better, works better as a, as, as a, handout. And I would agree with that just the slide, but there's a way that you could make this slide very valuable as a handout. Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody know what that is? Slide notes. Awesome, David. Yeah, awesome. Slide notes. Slide notes are a default of PowerPoint that Gaskin and, and Austin, those were the two creators of PowerPoint that they put in in the 1980s. I think it was, is brilliant. So I'm going to do a trick here. I'm going to jump to another slide. Does anybody know how to jump to a slide such that then you don't show all the slides in between? If you're in the, you, you have to be in the PowerPoint, you have to be in the slideshow mode. Does anybody know how to do that? Because a lot of people are just click, 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 but there's a way you can jump. 
Does anybody know how? F10. Uh, it could be. I don't know. It could be that. Write the number, press enter. Way to go, Mohan. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in the slide number and then I'm going to press enter. So here, what you see is you see the slide that I just created. But if I take, if I take Mohan, uh, if I take David's advice, what I can do is I can put all that information, actually in a much better form, into the notes page. And now the notes page becomes as valuable as the as as as, as what it is that we, you know, that the really clunky slide that that would lose audiences during the talk. Does everybody see that? I think that is so a lot of times people will say, uh, they'll argue against assertion evidence and say, yeah, I like the slides during the talk, but the slides have to stand as a handout. And here's my counter argument. I'd like to, at this time, just jump to a conclusion slide, because I think the conclusion slide is quite a bit different from other slides in that on this slide, you are going to make a transition from you primarily talking to kind of give things over to the audience. Also, this slide is often up, could be up for four or five minutes during the question period. And so you want to have something that is valuable. A lot of people don't have things that are valuable up. A lot of people will just have just the word questions up. And that is a zero, actually. That's less than zero. So here's how I would finish. So let's say you were doing this work on the biofuels. You're doing this work on a fuel crop for the Northeastern United States. And, you, and you've been testing whether miscanthus could be a promising fuel crop. And you decide that it is. And, and then you repeat your main reasons. It has a cold tolerance down to six degrees Celsius. It has a root depth of two meters. And so in the Northeast United States, we have a lot of hilly, hilly land and you need to have deep roots. Otherwise the plant could be washed away. And then the most important reason is Miscanthus, according to the National Academy of Sciences, has an energy ratio of six to one. And so you find maybe some way to conclude maybe a future perspective on your work, what you're gonna do next. And then rather than going to a zero slide where you just have the word questions, uh, well, before you do that, you need to say something before you ask for questions. Does anybody know what it is? There are two words actually you need to say. Uh, in French, maybe you can get by with uh, just one. Yes, yes, thank you. You need to say thank you. And you need to say thank you so that the audience has an opportunity to applaud. And you might think, oh, that's kind of self-serving, but it's actually really important because in a room, there will be people who are experts and then people who are kind of outside the expertise and they will look during the, the, the clapping to see how are the experts responding. And so you want to have, you want to have that applause. So Kiana here, she's going to, in a couple of years, she's going to be interviewing for a faculty position. And I would say in that particular talk, it's really important because you have in a, in a department, the whole department faculty will be at her talk. And maybe there'll be only two or three experts in her field. The others are really going to look to those experts during that applause to see what it is that, that they think. So you want to get that applause. And then when the applause starts to die down, then that's when you want to ask, ask the questions. So cool, it's 2.47. I do want to say a couple of things about delivery. And it's to me, it's really the third principle of the assertion evidence approach. And we've said not to have bulleted list, but what I, what I, what I would suggest to you is, is you, you have the main takeaway of each scene. You've got the visual evidence. Explain that visual evidence by fashioning sentences on the spot. 
So it doesn't mean that you just go in and wing it. You practice, practice quite a bit, but you, you practice so that you know you can say the scene, but you are not obligated to say the words in a particular sequence because that is too hard. That is too difficult to do. And my hero here is this Cheryl Hiyashi. And I think uh, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to escape for a second and then bring it up again. So that's okay. Uh, I didn't want to go there. I want to jump back to 57. Yeah, so you, now you can see Cheryl Hayashi here. So she's given a TED talk. As you can see, actually, she uses the assertion evidence approach. If you want to see her TED talk, it's one of my, maybe my favorite TED talk, just because I like how much she communicates. But I'd like to play a, a short clip, and I'd like you to think about how well the so think about delivery. What is it you like about her delivery? Okay. So this is just a short clip, just to give you a, a little bit of, because I kind of start in the middle. She's studying, she studies spiders. So I hope none of you have arachnophobia, but she studies spiders. And in particular, she studies the silk of spiders in terms of could we use that material? She's kind of a material scientist and a biologist. So uh, let's see, see how this works. There are many kinds of spider silk. For example, this garden spider can make seven different kinds of silks. When you look at this orb web, you're actually seeing many types of silk fibers. The frame and radii of this web is made up of one type of silk, while the capture spiral is a composite of two different silks, the filament and the sticky droplet. Just want to check, can, can everybody hear? Yes. Okay, fantastic. How does an individual spider make so many kinds of silk? To answer that, you have to look a lot closer at the spinneret region of a spider. So silk comes out of the spinnerets. And for those of us spider silk biologists, this is what we call the business end of the spider. We spend long days, hey, don't laugh, that's, that's my life. <laughs> we spend long days and nights staring at this part of the spider. And this is what we see. You can see multiple fibers coming out of the spinnerets because each spinneret has many spigots on it. Each of these silk fibers exits from a spigot, and if you were to trace the fiber back into the spider, what you would find is that each spigot connects to its own individual silk gland. A silk gland kind of looks like a sack with a lot of silk protein stuck inside. Okay, just, so you just saw just a little bit. What did you like about the delivery? What did you like about the delivery? Yeah, she, she, she makes a joke, but I would say, she, I would say that it's natural and it doesn't, it, it's not anything that makes anybody feel badly. I, I, I would not, I would not advise people to try to be funny, but I think what happens is she probably knows she would get that reaction. Yeah. So Sarah likes her passion, just how spontaneous she was. A Eamon said, yeah, I mean, the explanation was simple and easy to follow. She followed Einstein's thing. She was confident, but still natural. Yeah, I don't think she memorized it, but I do think she knew where she was going with every scene. Now that, that scene wasn't particularly technical. I wanna play a more technical scene, another short scene. Let's take a look at this one. I hope this one works. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Again, all you got to do is Google Ted Spiders if you want to want to see the whole talk. Now, it's really convenient that spiders use their silk completely outside their body. This makes testing spider silk really, really easy to do in the laboratory because we're actually, you know, testing it in air. That's exactly the environment that spiders are, are using their silk proteins. So this makes quantifying silk properties by methods such as tensile testing, which is basically, you know, tugging on one end of the fiber, very amenable. Here are stress strain curves generated by tensile testing, five fibers made by the same spider. So what you can see here is that the five fibers have different behaviors. Specifically, if you look on the vertical axis, that's stress. If you look at the maximum stress value for each of these fibers, you can see there's a lot of variation. And in fact, drag line or major ampullate silk is the strongest of these fibers. We think that's because the drag line silk, which is used to make the frame and radii for a web, needs to be very strong. On the other hand, if you were to look at strain, this is how much a fiber can be extended. If you look at the maximum value here, again, there's a lot of variation. And the clear winner is flagelliform or the capture spiral filament. In fact, this flagelliform fiber can actually stretch over twice its original length. So silk fibers vary in their strength and also their extensibility. In the case of the capture spiral, it needs to be so stretchy to absorb the impact of flying prey. If it wasn't able to stretch so much, then basically when an insect hit the web, it would just trampoline right off of it. So if the web was made entirely out of drag line silk, an insect is very likely to just bounce right off. But by having really, really stretchy capture spiral silk, the web is actually able to absorb the impact of that intercepted prey. There's quite a bit of variation within the fibers that an individual spider can make. We call that the toolkit of a spider. That's what the spider has to interact with their environment. But how about variation among spider species? So looking at one type of silk and looking at different species of spiders. This is an area that's largely unexplored, but here's a little bit of data I can show you. This is a comparison of the toughness of the dragline silk spun by 21 species of spiders. Some of them are orb-weaving spiders, and some of them are non-orb-weaving spiders. It's been hypothesized that orb-weaving spiders, like this Argiope here, should have the toughest dragline silks because they must intercept flying prey. What you see here on this toughness graph is the higher the black dot is on the graph, the higher the toughness. The 21 species are indicated here by this phylogeny, this evolutionary tree that shows their genetic relationships. And I've colored in yellow the orb web weaving spiders. If you look right here at the two red arrows, they point to the toughness values for the drag lines of Nephila clavipes and Arrhenius diadematus. These are the two species of spiders for which the vast majority of time and money on synthetic spider silk research has been to replicate their dragline silk proteins. Yet their dragline are not the toughest. In fact, the toughest dragline in this survey is this one right here in this white region, a non-orb web weaving spider. This is the dragline spun by Skytodes, the spitting spider. Skytodes doesn't use a web at all to catch prey. Instead, Skytodes sort of lurks around and waits for prey to get close to it and then immobilizes prey by spraying a silk-like venom on, onto that insect. Think of hunting with silly string. That's how Skytodes forages. We don't really know why Skytodes needs such a tough drag line, but it's unexpected results like this that make bioprospecting so exciting and worthwhile. It frees us from the constraints of our imagination. Now I'm gonna mark on the toughness values for nylon fiber, bombix or domesticated silkworm silk, wool, Kevlar and carbon fibers. And what you can see is that nearly all the spider drag lines surpass them. It's the combination of strength, extensibility and toughness that makes spider silk so special and that has attracted the attention of biomimeticists, so people that turn to nature to try to find new solutions. So what did you like here? What did you like here about 
this particular segment because I love how she is able to communicate actually very technical information in this segment. What do you think she does well? What do you think she does well? Yeah, very good, Miriam. The way she simplified and highlighted important information from the graphs. She tried to keep it simple. Yeah, the way she compared data. I mean, think about it. She's got her scatter plot with 28, 28 data points, and yet she focuses on three. Notice she doesn't clutter it with a lot of words of, of the names of the spiders. She, the three she knew, she, she owned those three. How did she keep, how did your eye know where to go with those data points? Yeah, she used air. Yeah, that's right, marking. She used arrows. She used arrows. That was that was really really good. Also, I loved how she had those five curves on the first graph, but she was smart. She didn't try to explain all five. She explained the one that had the the highest strain, and then the one that had the the highest stress. And so she just focused just on those two. I, I, I would recommend this, this one to you, not only for the delivery, but to me, the execution of an assertion evidence, assertion evidence talk, particularly with the, with the graphics. But then at this website that you see here on my conclusion slide, we have, there are a lot of model talks, and I encourage you to take a look at the model talks of Michelle Kays and, and others who are who are graduate students. Listen, I, I, you know, we have come to three o'clock. I thank you very much. I appreciate how great an audience you were. And I'm gonna turn things over to Kiana, but I will hang around here to answer questions.